Part Two of The Eyes Have It by Randall Garrett. The Eyes Have It, Part Two. My lady said, Sir Pierre gently, the Duke's investigators have arrived. My lady Alice, Countess de Vreau, was seated in a gold brocade upholstered chair in the small receiving room off the great hall. Standing near her, looking very grave, was Father Bright. Against the blaze of color on the walls of the room, the two of them stood out like ink blots. Father Bright wore his normal clerical black, unrelieved except for the pure white lace at collar and cuffs. The Countess wore unadorned black velvet, a dress which she had had to have altered hurriedly by her dressmaker. She had always hated black, and owned only the mourning she had worn when her mother died eight years before. The somber looks on their faces seemed to make the black blacker. "'Show them in, Sir Pierre,' the Countess said calmly. Sir Pierre opened the door wider, and three men entered. One was dressed as one gently born, the other two wore the livery of the Duke of Normandy. The gentleman bowed. "'I am Lord Darcy, chief criminal investigator for His Highness the Duke, and your servant, my lady.' He was a tall, brown-haired man in his thirties, with a rather handsome, lean face. He spoke Anglo-French with a definite English accent. "'My pleasure, Lord Darcy,' said the Countess. "'This is our vicar, Father Bright.' "'Your servant, Reverend Sir.' Then he presented the two men with him. The first was a scholarly-looking, graying man wearing pince-nez glasses with gold rims, Dr. Pateley, physician. The second, a tubby, red-faced, smiling man, was Master Sean O'Loughlin, sorcerer. As soon as Master Sean was presented, he removed a small, leather-bound folder from his belt-pouch, and proffered it to the priest. "'My license, Reverend Father.' Father Bright took it and glanced over it. It was the usual thing, signed and sealed by the Archbishop of Rouen. The law was rather strict on that point. No sorcerer could practice without the permission of the church, and a license was given only after careful examination for orthodoxy of practice. "'It seems to be quite in order, Master Sean,' said the priest, handing the folder back. The tubby little sorcerer bowed his thanks and returned the folder to his belt-pouch. Lord Darcy had a notebook in his hand. "'Now, unpleasant as it may be, we shall have to check on a few facts.' He consulted his notes, then looked up at Sir Pierre. "'You, I believe, discovered the body?' "'That is correct, your lordship. How long ago was this?' Sir Pierre glanced at his wrist-watch. It was nine-fifty-five. "'Not quite three hours ago, your lordship.' "'At what time, precisely?' "'I rapped on the door precisely at seven, and went in a minute or two later, say, seven o one or seven o two. How do you know the time so exactly? My lord the Count, said Sir Pierre with some stiffness, insisted upon exact punctuality. I have formed the habit of referring to my watch regularly. I see. Very good. Now, what did you do then? Sir Pierre described his actions briefly. The door to his suite was not locked then? Lord Darcy asked. No, sir. You did not expect it to be locked? No, sir, it has not been for seventeen years." Lord Darcy raised one eyebrow in a polite query. Never? Not at seven o'clock, your lordship. My lord the Count always rose promptly at six and unlocked the door before seven. He did lock it at night, then? Yes, sir. Lord Darcy looked thoughtful and made a note, but he said nothing more on that subject. When you left, you locked the door? That is correct, your lordship. And it has remained locked ever since? Sir Pierre hesitated and glanced at Father Bright. The priest said, At 8.15 Sir Pierre and I went in. I wish to view the body. We touched nothing. We left at 8.20. Master Sean O'Loughlin looked agitated. Er, excuse me, reverend sir. You didn't give him holy unction, I hope. No, said Father Bright. I thought it would be better to delay that until after the authorities had seen the, er, scene of the crime. 
I wouldn't want to make the gathering of evidence any more difficult than necessary. Quite right, murmured Lord Darcy. No blessings, I trust, reverend sir? Master Sean persisted. No exorcisms are— Nothing, Father Bright interrupted somewhat testily. I believe I crossed myself when I saw the body, but nothing more. Crossed yourself, sir. Nothing else? No. Well, that's all right, then. Sorry to be so persistent, reverend sir, but any miasma of evil that may be left around is a very important clue, and it shouldn't be dispersed until it's been checked, you see. Evil? My lady the countess looked shocked. Sorry, my lady, but— Master Sean began contritely. But Father Bright interrupted by speaking to the countess. Don't distress yourself, my daughter. These men are only doing their duty. Of course, I understand. It's just that it's so— She shuddered delicately. Lord Darcy cast Master Sean a warning look, then asked politely, Has my lady seen the deceased? No, she said. I will, however, if you wish. We'll see, said Lord Darcy. Perhaps it won't be necessary. May we go up to the suite now? Certainly, the countess said. Sir Pierre, if you will. Yes, my lady. As Sir Pierre unlocked the emblazoned door, Lord Darcy said, Who else sleeps on this floor? No one else, your lordship, Sir Pierre said. The entire floor is, was, reserved for my lord the count. Is there any way up besides that elevator? Sir Pierre turned and pointed toward the other end of the short hallway. That leads to the staircase, he said, pointing to a massive oaken door. But it's kept locked at all times, and, as you can see, there is a heavy bar across it. Except for moving furniture in and out or something like that, it's never used. No other way up or down, then? Sir Pierre hesitated. Well, yes, your lordship, there is. I'll show you. A secret stairway? Yes, your lordship. Very well. We'll look at it after we've seen the body. Lord Darcy, having spent an hour on the train down from Rouen, was anxious to see the cause of the trouble at last. He lay in the bedroom, just as Sir Pierre and Father Bright had left him. "'If you please, Dr. Pateley,' said his lordship. He knelt on one side of the corpse and watched carefully while Pateley knelt on the other side and looked at the face of the dead man. Then he touched one of the hands and tried to move an arm. "'Rigor has set in, even to the fingers. Single bullet hole. Rather small caliber. I should say a twenty-eight or thirty-four. Hard to tell until I've probed out the bullet. Looks like it went right through the heart, though. Hard to tell about powder burns. The blood has soaked the clothing and dried. Still, these specks. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. Lord Darcy's eyes took in everything, but there was little enough to see on the body itself. Then his eye was caught by something that gave off a golden gleam. He stood up and walked over to the great canopied four-poster bed. Then he was on his knees again, peering under it. A coin? No. He picked it up carefully and looked at it. A button, gold, intricately engraved in an arabesque pattern, and set in the center with a single diamond. How long had it lain there? Where had it come from? Not from the Count's clothing, for his buttons were smaller, engraved with his arms, and had no gems. Had a man or a woman dropped it? There was no way of knowing at this stage of the game. Darcy turned to Sir Pierre. When was this room last cleaned? Last evening, your lordship, the secretary said promptly. My lord was always particular about that. The suite was always to be swept and cleaned during the dinner hour. Then this must have rolled under the bed at some time after dinner. Do you recognize it? The design is distinctive. The privy secretary looked carefully at the button in the palm of Lord Darcy's hand without touching it. "'I... I hesitate to say,' he said at last. "'It looks like, but I'm not sure. Come, come, Chevalier, where do you think you might have seen it? Or one like it?' There was a sharpness in the tone of his voice. 
I'm not trying to conceal anything, your lordship, Sir Pierre said with equal sharpness. I said I was not sure. I still am not. But it can be checked easily enough. If your lordship will permit me. He turned and spoke to Dr. Pateley, who was still kneeling by the body. May I have my lord the Count's keys, doctor? Pateley glanced up at Lord Darcy, who nodded silently. The physician detached the keys from the belt and handed them to Sir Pierre. The privy secretary looked at them for a moment, then selected a small gold key. This is it, he said, separating it from the others on the ring. Come with me, your lordship. Darcy followed him across the room to a broad wall covered with a great tapestry that must have dated back to the sixteenth century. Sir Pierre reached behind it and pulled a cord. The entire tapestry slid aside like a panel, and Lord Darcy saw that it was supported on a track some ten feet from the floor. Behind it was what looked at first like ordinary oak paneling, but Sir Pierre fitted the small key into an inconspicuous hole and turned, or rather tried to turn. "'That's odd,' said Sir Pierre. "'It's not locked.' He took the key out and pressed on the panel, shoving sideways with his hand to move it aside. It slid open to reveal a closet. The closet was filled with women's clothing of all kinds and styles. Lord Darcy whistled soundlessly. "'Try that blue robe, your lordship,' the privy secretary said. "'The one with the—yes, that's the one.' Lord Darcy took it off its hanger. The same buttons. They matched. And there was one missing from the front. Torn off. "'Master Sean,' he called without turning. Master Sean came with a rolling walk. He was holding an oddly shaped bronze thing in his hands that Sir Pierre didn't quite recognize. The sorcerer was muttering, "'Eva, that there is. Faith, and the vibrations are all over the place. Yes, my lord. Check this dress and the button when you get round to it. I want to know when the two parted company.' "'Yes, my lord.' He draped the robe over one arm and dropped the button into a pouch at his belt. "'I can tell you one thing, my lord. You talk about an evil miasma. This room has got it.' He held up the object in his hand. "'There's an underlying background, something that has been here for years, just sipping in. But on top of that there's a hellish big blast of it superimposed. Fresh it is, and very strong.' "'I shouldn't be surprised.' "'Considering there was murder done here last night, or very early this morning,' said Lord Darcy. "'Hm, yes, yes, my lord, the death is there. But there's something else, something I can't place.' "'You can tell that just by holding that bronze cross in your hand?' Sir Pierre asked interestedly. Master Sean gave him a friendly scowl. "'Tisn't quite a cross, sir. This is what is known as a crux on seda. The ancient Egyptians called it an ink. Notice the loop at the top instead of the straight piece your true cross has. Now your true cross, if it were properly energized, blessed, you see, your true cross would tend to dissipate the evil. The ink merely vibrates to evil because of the closed loop at the top, which makes a return circuit. And it's not energized by blessing, but by another, um, spell. Master Sean, we have a murder to investigate, said Lord Darcy. The sorcerer caught the tone of his voice and nodded quickly. "'Yes, my lord,' and he walked rollingly away. "'Now where's that secret stairway you mentioned, Sir Pierre?' Lord Darcy asked. "'This way, your lordship.' He led Lord Darcy to a wall at right angles to the outer wall, and slid back another tapestry. "'Good heavens!' Darcy muttered. "'Does he have something concealed behind every arras in the place?' but he didn't say it loud enough for the privy secretary to hear. This time what greeted them was a solid-seeming stone wall, but Sir Pierre pressed in on one small stone, and a section of the wall swung back, exposing a stairway. "'Oh, yes,' Darcy said. "'I see what he did. This is the old spiral stairway that goes round the inside of the keep. There are two doorways at the bottom. One opens into the courtyard, the other is a postern gate through the curtain wall to the outside, but that was closed up in the sixteenth century, so the only way out is into the courtyard. 
"'Your lordship knows Castle de Vreau, then?' Sir Pierre said. The knight himself was nearly fifty, while Darcy was only in his thirties, and Sir Pierre had no recollection of Darcy's having been in the castle before. "'Only by means in the royal archives. But I have made it a point to—' He stopped. "'Dear me!' he interrupted himself mildly. "'What is that?' That was something that had been hidden by the heiress until Sir Pierre had slid it aside, and was still showing only a part of itself. It lay on the floor a foot or so from the secret door. Darcy knelt down and pulled the tapestry back from the object. Well, well, a twenty-eight caliber two-shot pocket gun. Gold chased, beautifully engraved, mother of pearl handle. A regular gem. He picked it up and examined it closely one shot fired. He stood up and showed it to Sir Pierre. Ever seen it before? The Privy Secretary looked at the weapon closely. Then he shook his head. Not that I recall, Your Lordship. It certainly isn't one of the Count's guns. You're certain? Quite certain, Your Lordship. I'll show you the gun collection if you want. My Lord the Count didn't like tiny guns like that. He preferred a larger caliber. He would never have owned what he considered a toy. Well, we'll have to look into it." He called over Master Sean again and gave him the gun into his keeping. And keep your eyes open for anything else of interest, Master Sean. So far everything of interest besides the late Count himself has been hiding under beds or behind arrases. Check everything. Sir Pierre and I are going for a look down this stairway. The stairway was gloomy, but enough light came in through the arrow slits spaced at intervals along the outer way to illuminate the interior. It spiraled down between the inner and outer walls of the great keep, making four complete circuits before it reached ground level. Lord Darcy looked carefully at the steps, the walls, and even the low, arched overhead as he and Sir Pierre went down. After the first circuit, on the floor beneath the Count's suite, he stopped. "'There was a door here,' he said, pointing to a rectangular area in the inner wall. "'Yes, Your Lordship, there used to be an opening at every floor but they were all sealed off. It's quite solid, as you can see. Where would they lead if they were open? The county offices, my own office, the clerk's offices, the constabulary on the first floor. Below are the dungeons. My lord the Count was the only one who lived in the keep itself. The rest of the household live above the great hall. What about guests? They are usually housed in the east wing. We have only two house-guests at the moment. Laird and Lady Duncan have been with us for four days." I see. They went down perhaps four more steps before Lord Darcy asked quietly, "'Tell me, Sir Pierre, were you privy to all of Count de Vreau's business?' Another four steps down before Sir Pierre answered. "'I understand what your lordship means,' he said. Another two steps. No, I was not. I was aware that my lord the Count engaged in certain, er, uh, shall we say, liaisons with members of the opposite sex. However—" He paused, and in the gloom Lord Darcy could see his lips tighten. However, he continued, I did not procure for my lord, if that is what you're driving at. I am not, and never have been, a pimp. I didn't intend to suggest that you had, good night," said Lord Darcy, in a tone that strongly implied that the thought had actually never crossed his mind. Not at all. But certainly there is a difference between aiding and abetting and simple knowledge of what is going on. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, one cannot, of course, be the secretary in private of a gentleman such as my lord the Count for seventeen years without knowing something of what is going on, you're right. Yes, yes. Hmm. Lord Darcy smiled to himself. Not until this moment had Sir Pierre realized how much he actually did know. In loyalty to his lord, he had literally kept his eyes shut for seventeen years. I realize, Lord Darcy said smoothly, that a gentleman would never implicate a lady nor besmirch the reputation of another gentleman without due cause and careful consideration. However, like the knight, he paused a moment before going on. 
although we are aware that he was not discreet, was he particular? If you mean by that, did he confine his attentions to those of gentle birth, your lordship, then I can say, no, he did not. If you mean did he confine his attentions to the gentler sex, then I can only say that, as far as I know, he did. I see. That explains the closet full of clothes. Beg pardon, your lordship? I mean that if a girl or woman of the lower classes were to come here, he would have proper clothing for them to wear, in spite of the sumptuary laws to the contrary. Quite likely, your lordship, he was most particular about clothing. Couldn't stand a woman who was sloppily dressed or poorly dressed. In what way? Well, well, for instance, I recall once when he saw a very pretty peasant girl. She was dressed in the common style, of course, but she was dressed neatly and prettily. My lord took a fancy to her. He said, Now there's a lass who knows how to wear clothes. Put her in decent apparel, and she'd pass for a princess. But a girl, who had a pretty face and a fine figure, made no impression on him unless she wore her clothing well, if you see what I mean, your lordship. Did you ever know him to fancy a girl who dressed in an off-hand manner? Lord Darcy asked. Only among the gently born, your lordship. He'd say, look at Lady So-and-so. Nice wench, if she let me teach her how to dress. You might say, your lordship, that a woman could be dressed commonly or sloppily, but not both. Judging by the stuff in that closet, Lord Darcy said, I should say that the late Count had excellent taste in feminine dress. Sir Pierre considered. Hmm. Well, now, I wouldn't exactly say so, your lordship. He knew how clothes should be worn, yes, but he couldn't pick out a woman's gown of his own accord. He could choose his own clothing with impeccable taste, but he'd not any real notion of how a woman's clothing should go, if you see what I mean. All he knew was how good clothing should be worn, but he knew nothing about design for women's clothing. Then how did he get that closet full of clothes? Lord Darcy asked, puzzled. Sir Pierre chuckled. Very simply, your lordship, he knew that the Lady Alice had good taste, so he secretly instructed that each piece that Lady Alice ordered should be made in duplicate, with small variations, of course. I'm certain my lady wouldn't like it if she knew. I dare say not, said Lord Darcy thoughtfully. Here is the door to the courtyard, said Sir Pierre. I doubt that it has been opened in broad daylight for many years. He selected a key from the ring of the late Count and inserted it in the keyhole. The door swung back, revealing a large crucifix attached to its outer surface. Lord Darcy crossed himself. "'Lord in heaven,' he said softly, "'what is this?' He looked out into a small shrine. It was walled off from the courtyard and had a single small entrance some ten feet from the doorway. There were four pre deus small kneeling benches, ranged in front of the doorway. "'If I may explain, your lordship,' Sir Pierre began. "'No need to,' Lord Darcy said in a hard voice. "'It's rather obvious. My lord the Count was quite ingenious. This is a relatively newly built shrine, four walls and a crucifix against the castle wall. Anyone could come in here, day or night, for prayer. No one who came in would be suspected.' He stepped out into the small enclosure and swung around to look at the door. And when that door is closed, there is no sign that there is a door behind the crucifix. If a woman came in here, it would be assumed that she came for prayer. But if she knew of that door... His voice trailed off. "'Yes, your lordship,' said Sir Pierre. "'I did not approve, but I was in no position to disapprove.' "'I understand.' Lord Darcy stepped out to the doorway of the little shrine and took a quick glance about. "'Then anyone within the castle walls could come in here,' he said. "'Yes, your lordship. Very well. Let's go back up.'" End of Part 2